I'm trying to create a bit of a um at your fingertips type of community where you can get those really quick tidbits of motivation on your own. Welcome to A Sister's Love, the podcast that help women who are healing by having those deep conversations, giving practical advice and words of encouragement. Come on, let's talk about it. Hello, my beautiful sisters, and welcome to another episode of my Sisters Love Podcast. On this episode of Sister Love Podcast, we have Harley. Harley is a act, an empathetic listener, and she is a certified life coach who hope women that need someone to listen to. She empathizes you, and she hope you to be comfortable with what's going on in your life, and help you to love yourself and embrace gratitude in every aspect of your life. But before we dive into that, I want to introduce myself. I am Rose Jones, your sister do love, and I'm your host here on A Sister's Love Podcast. And I'm just one woman with one voice trying to tell her stories and have a, open up a platform for women to do the same. So if you're in a space that you're ready to heal or you're on a journey of self-love and you need some advice, some resources, and you need a space that you feel safe in, then you are in the right place. I would love for you to hit that subscribe button, turn on your notifications so that you don't miss another episode at A Sister's Love Podcast. Today we have Harley, and I'm going to allow her to introduce herself and give us a little insight about her and her background story and what led her here today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. I appreciate anybody that gives me time to tell my little story on their platform. So thank you so much. I am Harley Hendricks. I am the hype woman you had no idea that you needed, but I'm glad that I get to meet you guys. I am an empathic listener, which is a fancy way of saying I'm a really good friend. And I'm also um, becoming a life coach as well as a dance instructor. I've been dan- I've been instructing sensual movement with the hopes of of increasing women's um, mindsets around their sensuality and their bodies for about upwards of 10 years. And um, that work kind of influenced me to start to do like outside of the dance floor work on just helping women with their minds and their mindsets. And I realized that a lot of us live a life of lack. And the only way that we can balance a life of lack is to realize how many reasons that we have to be intentionally grateful. So I built this platform on intentional gratitude, and I have just been pushing peace as far as influencing as many people as I can get to, to just be grateful for even the smallest things in life. Like I am grateful that I can breathe today. And just watching how that small bit of gratitude starts to kind of create this pebble effect, this kind of pebble in the ocean effect where if you just drop a little bit of positivity into your day, you'll start to see these things that are traditionally negative in your life shift. So I'm really excited to talk about that, talk about some of the products that I'm in the process of publishing for that, um, for like digital products. I feel like this is the age where you can get anything that you need at the Mm -hmm. click of your finger. So I am creating products that will help ground us daily in, in gratitude and positivity when we're in the hustle and bustle and maybe we can't get to our you know, our counselor, our life coach, our therapist, when we can't get to those big rocks in our lives, what are we doing on our own? And I'm trying to create a bit of a um, at your fingertips type of community where you can get those really quick tidbits of motivation on your own. That is awesome. Can you tell the listeners uh, what got you into this um, feel like what was that thing that made you want to actually do this and help women? Absolutely. So right before I, um, before the pandemic, I want to say I was a middle school special education teacher and I love kids. I love teaching. And I think teaching probably would have been something that I did for the rest of my life had I not um, realized that there was just something bigger kind of pulling down for me. Teaching pole dance was actually like my side hustle, right? So I would teach the kids in the daytime and then, you know, take off, take off the teacher gear and toss on the six inch heels and then teach the mamas at night. And my work at night set on my heart so much. Watching women walk into the dance studio and just feel so depleted and feel so sad and feel like there was nothing else for them to do. That hurt me as a woman who was waking up some days and feeling happy or down or whatever I was feeling. But to see women continuously feel and be friends with women who continuously felt like life was just happening to them 
every day it hurt me and I was like wow so when I kind of got um to the point where I no longer wanted to teach I was in a place where my own life was starting to be affected by teaching and my own mental health my partner was like you are not happy and so we need to figure this out um and he was so amazing and gracious to be able to kind of give me the opportunity to what I call retire right because after six years <laughs> And you can't really retire, but I did retire. I retired from teaching after six years <laughs> and I spent about uh, a year really at home. Um, he handled the finances in our home. And at the beginning of that year, I was just a woman living le a lu in luxury. You know what I mean? Like I was waking up and or waking up early enough to say goodbye to him because he's a truck driver. So I let him on out the door and I got the house clean and I was taking bubble baths in the middle of the day. <laughs> But then I got bored after about 30 days of doing that. And I started to answer calls on this app called Happy. Happy spelled H-A-P-I. So Happy Talker is a beautiful, amazing resource. And I'll give you a few links to kind of put into this, um, this episode so you can be able to help for your viewers if they have any following questions. Happy is a platform where you can anonymously sign up to talk on the phone with an anonymous person who is just there to listen to you literally is just there to listen to you so when I first started this it was about two years ago and this was a beta app it wasn't even like a full app yet it was in the process of kind of being tested so the people who own the app can see if this is something that people need do people need unbiased uh you know uh, advice or unbiased unsolicited um just space to be held and the in poor of people signing up to become happy listeners, the amount of talkers that were calling, because the amount of people who cannot afford, you know, a, a therapist, or the amount of people who are ashamed of even going into a therapist's office, and I don't know you, but looking another human being in the face and not feeling comfortable saying what is on their mind was insane. Plus, we were all at home alone during the pandemic. So a lot of people wanting this app caused the new owner to do a buyout of the first owner. And then the second owner, his this man, he came through as like a visionary and he created a full licensure program around empathic listening. So oh. he was just like, he was like, not only is is this you know, something that I feel that everybody needs, I feel that the people who are doing this need to be considered as some form of service provider. So this went from kind of a volunteer situation to a certification. So I was a part of the, the platform when you could just become a happy listener by signing up and answering a few you know paragraphs to say that I enjoy listening because into the fact that now if you go onto the Atlantic Listening Academy.com, you will see that there is a full globally recognized certification to become a part of this platform. And I still had to take the certification and I still had to pay for it. And it, I tell people the, the certification itself is an investment, but it is necessary. And in the midst of me answering calls on Happy, a lot of the people on the app were asking me, like, are you a counselor? Are you a life coach? Are you are you any of this? And I'm like, no, no but... <laughs> But you guys are sparking my interest and I'm, I just left out of teaching and I didn't know where I wanted to go after that. And so I started to realize that life coaching and just like success coaching is something that I was definitely interested in. I was not interested in going back to school to become a full fledged therapist. And I realized that. But the certifications that I've been taking that are going to allow me to be what I call a success coach is like right along lines of what I wanted. And so then when I started doing it at first, I was like, I want to help everybody do everything because yeah. everybody should be happy. And <laughs> uh, my mentor was just like, Harley, you need a target audience. Mm -hmm. And not only do you need a target audience, you you need a niche of some sorts. You need you need something that is unique to you. And um, And so I sat down with that for a very long time. And I realized that I am one of the most gracious people that I know. Mm -hmm. I can find like I, I use I joke about this a lot, but like I could fall down a flight of stairs today and be like, well, at least I'm getting where I'm going. Mm -hmm. fast. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I have this mindset where it's like I don't I wake up every day and I tell life like you can't give you can give me some of the worst circumstances. I'm not going to acknowledge it as a, as a bad day. I, I want a good day. I, I am intentionally happy. I'm happy on purpose. And I realize like that's my niche. That's that's who I am. I am 
the breath of fresh air when life feels like it's suffocating you. I've had friends tell me, I love calling you when I want to hear the best of life. You get on my nerves when I want to be sad, but I love it. And I realized that, you know, I I was really ashamed of it because I used to get so angry with myself. Sometimes this was this was like a reflex. I would, you know, I would want to be sad and something in my brain would be like, well, at least we got this. And I'm like, girl, <laughs> girl. But I realized that this is something that is necessary and needed in this world. People are not grateful. People are not happy and people do not provide a lot of grace. And so I was like, okay, great. Now I know what I want to do. And then I started to kind of fine tune uh, my, my experiences. So then I opened up a... Um, a digital store on this website called Stan. So my my current website is stan.store slash Harley Hendrick 6. And when you go there, you'll be able to see all of the different calls that you can do with me. Like some people might just need to vent. There's a call there where you can pay me and you talk the whole 15 minutes, the whole 30 minutes, the whole hour. And I say nothing. I just give you a space to vent. There's another call where you are feeling low and you might not say very much. You need to hear me encourage you. You need to hear me influence and give you all this love. That's my pick me up. That's my joy call. I'm going to I'm going to feed into you. I'm going to pour into you. All I ever ask is that you give me some information so I can pour into you. Because some folks will call me and be like, I'm sad. Help me. And I'm like, I just met you. I don't know (laughs) you. But tell me a little bit about your life. And I promise you, I'll pull out all of the good things where you were only hearing the bad things. Um, But then there are some people who are not in a bad mood. They just are ready to to be excited about something. And the people around them are not very supportive. The people around them don't love them that much to be happy when they are doing well. I have these things called joy calls. You can sit on the phone with me and tell me good news for 15 minutes. And I'm going to act like your auntie that been watching you go through this your whole life. And I'm going to pump you up because I just feel like at the end of the day, all of us are going through something and everybody needs somebody. And so I've positioned myself on all of my social media platforms as as hopefully a somebody for some of everybody. I call myself lovingly Auntie Harley because I like to think, you know, I don't have any children. I'm probably never going to have any children. Um, I found out from doctors that I am I am likely infertile. But my entire life, I have just loved on everybody's children around me my nieces my nephews all of the kids like I have I know people whose kids won't go to nobody they'll come to Auntie Harley so I I felt like you know at the end of the day while it was a very hard thing for me to conceptualize as a woman especially a black woman knowing that I would never be able to give life I realized I am nurturing in a whole different way I help bring people's gratitude and happiness back to life in their lives. I've been on conversations with people on happy where at the beginning of us talking, they couldn't find two things that were positive about their life. And now I can sit on the phone with these people for two, three minutes and listen to them gush about how happy they are. And I know that it was the love that I poured into them, the consideration and the perspective shifting that I assisted with that did that. And that makes me feel so amazing. That is awesome. Um, do you like me? I, I kind of do the same thing, but for some reason I tap out like after a while, like, I start to, I, I feel like more like an empath, like instead of empathetic, listen, like I take on every emotion that people, when they listen to me, when I'm listening to people, I literally like take on that emotion. I embody, like I'm taking it out of their body and putting it in mine and it literally drains me. It's like, is it a way, something that you do that stops you from being drained or affected by the emotional things that these people are telling you? Oh, absolutely. I love that question. Mm-hmm. The art of detachment. Mm-hmm. I don't feel my emotions heavy enough to even know how to take on another person's emotions anymore. When I'm angry, I'm not angry for very long. I practice it first with my emotions. I allow my emotions to be a visitor only in my life. And so if I'm angry, what what are we really angry about, Harley? Let's break this down. Let's talk about it. And so I essentially practice my happy cause with my own authentic emotions. And so when people are giving me their emotions... I I can't even grab them as hard as I used to because I, I I definitely empathize with that. At the beginning mm-hmm. of the experience, I was very much in this place of like, oh my God, I can't believe they did that to you. And I felt it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But then I realized that it was because I was also feeling my own authentic emotions in a very um, 
tumultuous way, right? And so when I was happy, busting out the seams, super happy. When I was sad, like everything needs to stop, super sad. I'm becoming a lot more regulated. And I believe that it is reading books and um, looking at publications and things of that nature around detachment. Detachment is not, I don't care about anything, which a lot of us kind of said, like, I want to practice detachment. I want to stop caring. Detachment is literally, I see it and I witness it, but I am not it. I don't say I am very often anymore like I used to go I am mad or I am sad I never say that anymore I feel sad I feel Mm -hmm. mad and so even my verbiage even the way I see the things that I feel it puts me in this position where I am no longer so malleable and manipulative that I can grab an emotion and it be my identity for any longer than it needs to be now my emotions they kind of sit on the end table where they used to sit on the couch right next to me look at me in my shoulder to shoulder now I'm starting to get to this point where I am appreciative of every positive emotion that comes but I don't let those emotions make me forget that I'm gonna have negative emotions and when I get to my negative emotions I don't allow them to trick me into believing that I've never had positive ones and that's what also helps me show up really well in my calls I know that's a good idea. I thought about that. Like, so it's pretty much like sitting in the place of understanding that this is something that's happening to me or something that happened, but it's it's not who I am or what it is who I am becoming. So it's like that attachment, like we can experience this. We're experiencing this or experience this, but it's not who I am. And a lot of people embody and think like, okay, because I experienced this, this is who I am now. And I have to carry this with me everywhere I go. Yes. And one of the things that has helped me, um, and I, I literally even have it on my wall, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. And it's so <laughs> funny because people like it's so it's so silly, but it's so real because I will I used to overthink to this point where I would probably see somebody trip down a flight of stairs, right? And something inside of my mind would laugh. The overthinking part of my mind will be like, you have no empathy for human life. How mm-hmm. dare you laugh at this person falling down a flight of stairs? And in the midst of me beating myself down, I didn't even realize this person that got up there laughing. They themselves find it funny because sometimes things are what they are in that moment and they don't mean anything to the greater good or the overarching reliability of your future. Sometimes things are what they are in that isolated event. I can find... I can find a situation funny without thinking ill of the bigger subject matter at hand. I can I can find it, I can find jokes about my about my people funny without saying that I don't care about African American people. And I feel that a lot of us live in this in this place in our mind where we lack the idea of duality. So because we lack this idea of duality, we beat ourselves up really harshly about the emotions that we have. If we find ourselves being envious of somebody else's success, instead of saying, I am envious in this way because I know that I need to be doing a little bit more with my own platform and this is how I'm going to be motivated and this is how I'm going to show up in my platform and do better. We will be like, now why I'm being jealous of her? That's my friend and she's doing good in her life. I'm supposed to be happy for her. You can be happy for her and both be encouraged in your own journey and realize Mm -hmm. that this can also be happening for you. And a lot of us fight that in our head. We do not, we do not establish that as fact. We don't believe that we can be a really great person and have some of these not so great people or attributes because we have been taught if you are a good person, you don't feel these things. But that's a lie. I can be an amazing person. I can be the biggest cheerleader that anybody wants and still feel jealousy. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I have to learn that two truths can exist at the same time. That was like the biggest thing that came to me. Like two truths can exist at the same time. When I was in therapy, she's like, you know, two, both of these things can be true at the same exact time. I'm like, what? We live in a world that we think only one truth exists, but both things, like you said, duality, they can exist at the same exact time. Uh, just acknowledging that they both are true and they both are happening at the same time. You can love yourself and hate yourself at the same exact time. At the same time. And honestly, the, the way that it helps me, I think if you and I were sitting the, the way we are right now and the number nine or six was in between us, you would see a six yeah. and I would see a nine. Neither of us are wrong. 
Exactly. Visually, this is possible. So if visually this is possible, then if I sit down and have a conversation with you and this person says that, you know, a woman who is, for instance, this is the biggest podcast, uh, you know, conversation ever. Women that are, are sexually promiscuous cannot be wives. You are not supposed to love your body and have sex and have sex in abundance and be considered to be someone's wife. I don't, I'm not wearing my ring because I'm a horrible person and I was pole dancing earlier. <laughs> I'm about to be somebody's wife. <laughs> and I and I am a woman who lives in her sexuality. It's actually my job to help other women live and hone in their sexuality. And I tell people, I do not attack the men that say, Harley, a woman like you could never be my wife because they are they are looking at a six and I am looking at a nine. Yeah. A thousand percent agree with you, sir. I could never be your wife, but I don't want to be. So your sex is perfectly safe. I don't have to yell at you. I don't have to make any woman that wants to be in your life feel small because that's who she is. None of that. None of that. I say that. However, my nine is still correct. Mm -hmm. I am a woman who loves Cardi B, Slickiana, and Sexy Red, but I'm about to be somebody's wife. Yes. I totally agree. I say that all the time, like, we don't have to knock people down because they're not our our cup of tea. Everybody have a tea. Everybody like their tea different ways. And that's what it is. We don't have to make ourselves feel better by making somebody else's tea seems bad, worse. You know what I'm saying? We all like what we like. And it's okay. We don't have to knock down or try to break down the next person because it's not our preference or what we want to uh, go towards. So I totally agree. But we like it. Everybody got their people. It's to how many millions and billions of people in this world? We only got one. So if we all the same, well, how are we gonna find our one? So no, no, they we can't be the same. We're uniquely. I said there are eight billion people in the yeah. world. I'm a black girl that wears cat ears. I know black people who do, who look at me and be like, but hey, if it's floating my boat, baby, let me float on. I tell people all the time, if a person is around me enjoying themselves and they are not causing bodily, physically, or mental mm -hmm. harm to any person that is non-consenting, mm -hmm. I have nothing to say. My least favorite memes are the memes where people be like, it's not a flex to blank, blank, blank. Baby, if you're flexing, it's a flex. It's a flex. Exactly. exactly. It's a flex. If you are flexing, it's a flex. And that's like the, that's the premise of my platform. And I think a lot of people, when they hear gratitude, they immediately hear like this overarching acceptance. They hear lack of boundaries. They hear lack of accountability. And it's like, absolutely not. Oh. We got boundaries here. We got accountability here. I'm going to hold myself responsible, but I'm not going to shame myself. Like I see, mm -hmm. I've been seeing a meme recently that has really broken my heart that so many people share it. They People are sharing this meme that, that reads, we live in a day and age where people um, are embracing what they should be ashamed of. And there are so many people who are sharing and it's like, yeah, these people need to be ashamed of themselves. Why? 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 Why does anybody ever need to be ashamed? Sure it's a shame. If they want to do it, they're ashamed of themselves. So they reflecting, projecting their insecurities on the other people. Because you're insecure about it doesn't mean the next person have to be. That's something that you can't explore. And that's okay. It's okay. That's not part of your DNA. That's not part of who you are. And that's okay. But don't don't shame other people because that is and they comfortable in their being to do that. And and what's so funny is we never really have a real argument. That's yeah. why people should be ashamed. Like you, you hear a person go through like, this all the time with people. They're like, you have some societal rule or something that someone told you that we don't even know the source of that said we don't supposed to do this or say this. So we supposed to follow this rule. And I don't say I like when you said you was a potty mouth when you first started, like. I am too. And people are like, women are supposed to curse. You're supposed to die. I was like, who said that? Who said that? Grandma, 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 grandma. I said, she don't even know who told her that. Why do I listen to her? She don't even know why they said it. And I said, me personally, I can say fuck shit ass. And it, those words actually doesn't have a harsh meaning. But the word stupid, retard, <laughs> and it has a harsher meaning than the words that I'm saying. But you tell me I can't say that. Mm -hmm. Go around calling people stupid and mm -hmm. retard. And people so, will say it all day. Mm -hmm. People will say it all day. Mm -hmm. Exactly. People will call inanimate mm -hmm. objects retarded. 
over and over again. People will use the word gay as a slur. Exactly. But let me say fuck and oh my God. We are not allowed to speak like you're not allowed. You are a woman. Present yourself. But what the word fuck is not even a bad word. You do it all the time. So what are we talking about here? What are we talking about? Like, I don't like people, they just do based on what they're told instead of using their own brain. Like let's 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 think logical here. Let's think about what is the actual meaning behind these words and what we're actually doing. And you're gonna start thinking of your own and start thinking of what people tell you to do, and you'll realize, like, oh, maybe it does make sense. Maybe I should step out of this. Maybe I should explore it a little bit more. Instead, it's like, nope, this is the rules and I'm gonna stick to it. And if it's you that type of person, I'm okay with that. But don't try to come over here and tell me I gotta say stick to your rules when I got my own rules over here too. Critical thinking is at an all-time low. People do not think critically. People are people have a herd mentality. And it's so funny because we have a herd mentality, but not a village mentality, mm -hmm. right? And so we can all stand around each other, but not stick together, which is so funny to me. Um, <laughs> because we can all do the same thing, but we can't stand for the same cause, which is very, very funny and interesting to me. But what I tell people all the time is if you just think critically about two things, if you think critically about two things that you that you are doing, then I guarantee you that if that critical thinking, that ability to think that way immediately will start to make you unravel everything. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, TikTok just violated me for hate speech, but neither of you oh. said anything hateful. So... I'm like, no, I'm actually going to, I'm going to appeal that. Um, yeah. I'm like, I'm going to appeal that because I don't understand that. Um, so you have to talk to me about that. I have to understand. Yeah. But um, but no, we, we have such a herd mentality and people have this mindset of I'm going to do whatever I think I'm supposed to do because I think I'm going to get this type of outcome. And I think we're getting to this point in our lives where we realize nothing is guaranteed. And so now people are getting more comfortable living freely. Yep. And so that's why I appreciate my platform because I can allow people to understand that it is so important to be locked in because your path might be a one person path. Mm -hmm. It might truly be a one person path. And if it is, are you grateful for that path enough to stick on it if nobody else wants to hop on? And a lot of people are not. Not. Because it's hard. people don't like a, a lot of people don't like to stand alone. A lot of people think that uh, if they're by themselves, that it's not going to be support. It's not going to be that. But once a lot of you're, you think that you're on your, you think you're by yourself, but once you start, when you stay focused and you stay on that path, you will realize that so many other people on that path with you, but you won't, you haven't, you haven't stuck there long enough to see them. You haven't, mm -hmm. stuck, you can't, you stop walking, you stop walking, you gotta keep walking. And once you get to a destination, like, oh my God, there's actually other people here with me. But if you don't keep walking, you won't see it. So I believe that like each path, we, we have our people, we have our community. We are, like you said, 8 billion people. We're, we're going to gravitate to who we're going to gravitate to. You just got to stay there. You have to be authentic. You have to be unique. You have to stand in your truth to find your people. That ain't, I, I was just saying this. I actually have a video on my social media that I was saying, you have to acknowledge after a hard part in your life or after trauma, your soul needs to quarantine. It's kind of mm -hmm. like when if you catch actual COVID, you have to spend 14 days away from anything or anybody that you can get sick physically before you can even, you know, attempt to go around your friends, family, and, and things of that nature. So if I just got left out of an abusive relationship, I was just being abused for like, let's say the last three years, I'm going to need to spend some time by myself quarantining purging my soul of the negativity before I try to start another relationship before yep. I try to be friends with somebody before I try to build another village I can't build another village I can't start another relationship I can't do any of these things I can't do any of these things if I myself am still sick 
I'm on soul quarantine first. And that's that lonely period where a lot of us, we lose the fight because we're like, I already been alone being with this person. Mm -hmm. So I want to be around some people, but we have to stay the course. We have to stay focused. We have to remind ourselves, deal with the isolation, learn the lessons. Because like you said, on the other end of that is your village and the people that you're going to be with. But those people don't deserve the broken parts of you. No, nope, that's think true. They do. We think that people are supposed to meet us in pieces and be like, okay, here, I'm going to take this piece. Mm -hmm. and I'm gonna piece and I'm No, people want to meet you with the cracks from all the pieces that you've put together. But putting it together is still your work. That's yeah. still your house. Somebody came into your house and threw shit on your floor. You're not going to leave it on the floor waiting for them to come clean it up. You're going to pick that shit up. Mm -hmm. And this is for our house. That's how our emotions are. That's how our hearts are. A lot of us have hearts that are completely tarnished by other people. And these people are dead and gone. And you're still sitting around holding on, waiting for their apology. That person is not alive anymore. You have to find a way to move on and forge forward without that apology so you can get your house in order. I totally agree. I say it all the time, like, I have my pair. You said 14 eight. I, I kind of went six months. But, like, it all depends on the people. But, like, I couldn't be around people. I couldn't be around nothing. I had to literally just sit with myself and just relearn myself, relove myself, and regroup before I could even re-enter and just be in relationship with people and things. Like, it just I just didn't feel myself. I didn't think it was fair to the people or to myself to actually be in the spaces. Mm-hmm. Because we don't, we don't realize how unapproachable, unlovable, mm -hmm. and unagreeable we become when we become traumatized. Mm -hmm. When somebody is hurting you, when somebody is discrediting you, when someone is being inconsiderate to you, you develop a harsh exterior that becomes uncomfortable to be around to people who are not a reason for you to be on guard. Mm hmm Oh, and you got, this, the, you got this wall up at all times to people that didn't deserve the wall. Like, what did I do? Like, why, why are you, why are you so aggressive towards me? And they not even realizing because they haven't did the process of healing or isolating themselves and working on themselves that they even got this wall up. They mm -hmm. might have like, I'm about the situation. I'm fine. That's not bothering me. And all of a sudden, this this big wall come knocking down, and like, boom, you get pushed away. And people don't feel like you can feel people' energy. You can feel when they're in the defense, and they don't, they don't feel it because they just think they're just walking and just normal. But if people that truly love you and know you, they can feel your energy switch. They can feel when something happened or is bothering you, and you don't think that they can. But we all, if we love and truly love people, we can feel all that, and people yeah. don't realize that. Even if you don't love a person, energy mm -hmm. doesn't lie. Yeah. I've been in a room with people who I've never met before, but I was like, you having a bad day and I'm about to get out of your way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But like, it will affect them. Like, if you love the person, it will affect you way more because what well, with me it does, because I kind of like embody people feelings because I didn't learn how to do that, the, uh, the art of detachment. So I will literally like go into problem solving mode. Like, well, how can I solve this problem? How can we work through this? And they don't want to solve the problem. They just want to avoid the problem. So, and then now that that put us in conflict because I, want, I feel like I want to help them. They don't want the help. And now we're both like in a battle because I like my person is hurting and I don't want my person to hurt. And because that person didn't do the work, now I'm in a place of making this person feel discomfort, but I'm thinking I'm trying to make them feel comfortable. You know what I'm saying? Like conflict. I tell the people unhappy this often, and I'm going to give this to you. Mm -hmm. Happiness and help are just like sex. You have to get other people's consent to do it. Mm -hmm. You cannot tell another person, I'm going to make you happy without checking in to make sure that they need to be made happy. Because mm -hmm. they might need that suffering. They might choose that suffering. And if that is something that they choose, none of us can do anything to help them. I give a, I give a, the same tangible example. I was walking through Kroger one day and a young lady on one crutch was shopping in Kroger and she had the crutch and she had her buggy and she knocked down a box of cereal. Now, I didn't realize that she did it on purpose and I went running to her aid, picked up the box of cereal. First time I did it, she said, thank you. But she never moved from that spot. I went back down the aisle, kept doing my shopping. 
I heard the box fall again. She knocked it down again. Now I'm thinking in my head, oh, she just really needs some help. She really struggling. That poor baby. I've created a reality for this person in my head that they didn't ask me to do. Let me go help her again. And the second time I went to go do it before I got there, she used her free hand and said, I'm doing this on purpose. I need to learn how to pick this up. Please don't help me. And that made me realize mm -hmm. that it is not common nature and it is not common sense the way my ego wanted me to think, mm -hmm. say, I want to help you. I have to ask the person, do you need help? No matter how close you are to me, I don't care if you're my mother, I don't care if you're my sister, I don't care who you are to me, I cannot ever assume that I know better for you than you do. Mm -hmm. And I had to get better at that, even with strangers. This person is walking around with a crush. They need help. No, they don't. They need to live their life and follow their path. And they need a space where they feel comfortable being able to ask for help. But if you are a person who are eager to give help, and I say this to myself and I say this to other listeners, and I want to give this as well mm -hmm. to you, if, as people who want to give help, our, our knee jerk has to be, do you need help? Mm -hmm. And when a person says no, even if they we feel like they just saying no because they mad and they angry and they need somebody to be there, we have to accept no. And mm -hmm. we have to choose not to engage because then we create beef between us and them that don't need to be there. Mm -hmm. I don't know why you not I don't know why you not letting me help you. I I I got you. I know what to do. I know how to fix this problem. No, you don't. You've never been in that situation in that person's shoes. And I usually, I, I usually even say that in the mirror. I used to go, Harley, how arrogant of you. That is, because I am. I'm arrogant, too. I just take it home because I'm like, I know what I'm doing. Like, do you, and then we get offended. So I'm like, you don't trust me enough to help you? Or you don't believe that I have the capabilities out? And now I'm taking, I'm refusing my help personal. Yeah. And then what's so funny is I used to tell myself every time I tried to go out of my way to help somebody else, I used to say, Harley, come here. Let's talk a little bit. Let's talk about your life. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your life. Is all your dots in a row? Oh, they not. So how mm -hmm. the hell are you trying to show up right here? And this ain't together in your life. You ain't got your content out. This website ain't up. We got three, got three workshops that we didn't bought and we ain't, we ain't looked at them workshops, but I'm chasing my sister down, trying to ask her why she ain't doing the certification. That's not my job. Mm -hmm. And so another thing that helps me with getting out of my ego and getting out of other people's business is, is, is really just looking at my to-do list because a lot of us are the same. The people who are, 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 who are so eager to help and so ready to show up for a person. We are also the people every new year. Next year, I'm going to have to look out for myself a lot more because my money wasn't what I wanted it to be. And I didn't do all of the things that I wanted to do this year. And it's because I was always helping everybody else. 80% of the people you helped in that year didn't ask you to do any of what you did. That is so that means about 60% of that you could have been doing things for yourself. But instead, we go out of our way to help other people instead of acknowledging what is really true in our lives that a lot of us are running away from our own issues. A lot of us are running away from our own our own responsibilities. A lot of us are putting to the side our own issues, our own to-do list to be able to hunt another person down. And really, if we go even deeper, we realize the arrogance of trying to help another person out because I'm not trying to help you out because I think that's going to be a, the best good for you. I'm helping you out because if you have this situation fixed, then you show up in my life the way I see it in my head. It's still mm -hmm. arrogant. It's still, it's still arrogance. I don't have your best interest at heart. And it's so funny because all of the nicest people in the world that I know are like, people don't appreciate me. I show mm -hmm. up. I'm helping people. I'm doing this. You're not helping them. You are trying to mold them into the thoughts that you have in their, your head because you believe that if you get them this job, if you do this for them, if you help them figure that out, then they will show up to you in your life the way you want them to show up. How many of us have helped a man get income thinking that he was going to start taking us out on dates and then he disappeared? He never had the intention to take you out on dates. He never had the intention to show up the way you had it in your head. But you thought that the money was the issue. So you went and got him a job. 
You thought that the car was an issue, so you went and helped him get a car. You thought that his friends were the issue, so you chased away all his friends, and you realized that the issue was intent. Mm -hmm. People will do what they want to do, but we will go out of our ways to help people, to make them show up in our life the way that we want them to show up. And the reality is, is that was never their position. That is true. That's a whole thing. Clap right there. That's a whole thing. <laughs> But when I learned God. that, when I learned that, it also helped me turn my gratitude inward mm -hmm. because I was struggling with gratitude because I was looking for external things to be gracious about. I was looking to be grateful that people were doing the things that I had in my head that people should be doing for me. And it wasn't that I was asking too much. It was just that I was in a place. First of all, I was in a place where I wasn't doing for myself and nobody's going to take care of your house if you don't. If I walk into your house and you throwing shit on your floor, even if I'm not a person who throw trash on the floor, I'm not going to get up and walk through your house and go to the garbage can. Yeah. And everybody else throwing stuff on the floor. So when we when we avoid our own selves to try to help other people, we message to people without saying it that I come last. So it's hard for you to be able to think that people are going to put you first when you're coming last in your own life. When that is true. I've been person. working on that this year. This year, I've definitely been working at, especially with the kids, like draining myself with my kids and my family and stuff like that. Like literally tell them like, no, like I literally devoted one day of the week, like every Wednesday. I'm like, I don't care what you got to do, what you got to say, nothing. That's my day. I don't, Mommy's care. Day. I don't care. Like I'm like, y'all better figure out who's going to cook dinner. Y'all better have this plan before Wednesday comes because I ain't doing it. I ain't doing it. I ain't doing Every it. parent, and I say I say parent because I want your viewers to know that mm -hmm. this is not gender specific. Every parent needs a weekly, but if not weekly, definitely a monthly day off. Mm -hmm. Yep. It is not logical just because you brought another person into this world that you never have a moment to take a breath until that person is able to sustain themselves. It is not logical. Give me one moment. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Six minutes. I have to look at it. My chair went down. Back. technical difficulties all around. Look at that. <laughs> but no, but no, it is not logical to think to yourself that you created another human being and so now emotionally and physically and spiritually you are tethered for the rest of your life that is so sick to think that every person deserves a time to be just human no matter who you are no matter what you're doing and if you have children and like you are you've done if you have not set that boundary y'all set that boundary get you a mommy day off get you a daddy day off get you a guardian day off even if you are a you know a legal guardian of a child and you are showing up there has to be time off that was the reason for our villages when when we had when we lived in this in, with this village mindset where everybody took care of everybody all them kids stay at so and so parent house. You know, when we back when we all had cousins and aunties up the wazoo. Mm -hmm. All of us would stay at somebody's auntie house, and now those other three or four groups of parents get a chance to get a break. And then that parent they took on everybody for that month. Now we alternate months. Imagine with a community where there were five houses. There were five houses, five two parent households with. Two kids in there apiece, and one household took every kid for a date night for the parents once a month. Imagine the type of communication that we could get done, the vacation and that we can get done, the experiences that we can get done. Imagine if those same five houses started a garden in each one of those backyards. And imagine if all five of those families shared goods and services. Imagine if two of those mothers were, were teacher certified and they were teaching those kids in the houses and and the dads all had carpentry degrees. So all of the things that have to happen inside the houses are made in house. And imagine if one of those mothers is a seamstress. And so now all of the clothes that we have are coming from that community. Imagine what happens with just five houses, 10 adults. <laughs> 20 children imagine what those kids think 
Those kids don't think another don't think twice if they go into school and somebody wants a little bit of their uh, their food and you give them a little bit of your food and, and they give you a little bit of those food. We have to shift our mindset. And so many of us don't have that mindset. We have a mindset of lack. Yeah. We have a mindset of, I don't know if I'm going to ever get this again. So this is mine. Nobody can touch mm -hmm. it. And we do this with people. We do this with happiness. We do this with everything. We hold things and we harbor things. And if you've ever held a puppy or a baby and you squeezed it too tight, you almost killed it. Yeah. And that is what we do with our emotions. That's what we do with love. That's what we do with affection. Affection and things of that nature, they're fragile, like a baby, like a puppy. We should be able to cradle it. And we should get it in abundance that it comes in and it goes out. But we don't. And because we don't, when we get it, we squeeze it. And if we squeeze it too hard, we will snap its neck. Snap it. Mm -hmm. And we'll lose it. And we don't realize. And then we're like, what happened? What happened? What happened? And I used to do that. I used to do that with my kids too because of my trauma. I used to hold them so so tight. I used to I'd be the helicopter parent in the nights. Nice, and the more I held, the more they slipped away. The more I held, the more they slipped away. And I'm like, okay, let me just let me just let go a little bit. And as the more I let go, the closer they became, the closer I became. And then I realized like holding on to stuff too tight or trying to control situations is not helpful it's not helpful it's just like we have to sometimes we have to let things go for it to come back you know what i'm saying you got to let things go to let it come back and just realize what is meant to be is gonna be you know what i'm saying and just do what do right by yourself and right by the people around you and the things will come that and we have to yeah. we have to love ourselves yeah. enough that i feel comfortable letting go of things mm -hmm. Because I know that yes. things that are meant for me, I want everything that's in my life to want me. Yeah. So my I don't, I tell, I tell don't people, want that I don't have restrictions on my partner. My partner can walk up to a woman and tell her that she's beautiful. And a lot of women will look at me and be like, did you just hear what he said? I say, yeah, she is beautiful. Yeah. I, I don't have restrictions. I don't make, I don't restrict this man. I don't, I don't make this man do anything, but he also understands that these are, there are certain things that I consider disrespectful. And he knows that if he crossed those lines, because he knows how gracious I am to whatever it is that he does, he also knows that I'm just as stern. And so he understands mm -hmm. that I want you in my life only if you want to be good to me. I want you in my life only if you want to be faithful to me. I want you in my life only if you want to do right by me. And in order for me to do that, I can't helicopter you. I can't. I can't put obligations on you. I can't harbor any any type of emotions based upon the things that you do and don't do. First of all, the type of woman that I am, I'm a person who I love on people so aggressively that people will assume that I'm flirting with them, and I'm not. Uh, yeah. Because I'm. I'm just. I'm a person. I'll walk up to you and be like, "Oh my gosh, you're so beautiful," and people will be like. I wonder why she told me she that I'm so beautiful. What 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 was to that? And I don't even remember you, but it was just because that in that moment I found you to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, we are so we're in this place, like you said, of overanalyzing. And it's funny because we overthink, but we don't think very much at all. So exactly. All we live on a loop of the same thought because it's like, mm -hmm. how are we overthinking and still not being critical enough? Exactly. Like that doesn't make sense. Like we're overthinking and assuming because when we're overthinking, we're assuming we're not actually processing. We're assuming we're making false realities and bringing them into our reality. And now we're not actually breaking down the reality that we actually have. You know what I'm saying? We're just creating false realities. And that's what the problem is. Oh yeah, this makes sense. So I'm going to believe that. Let's just bring it in here. Like now this person don't like me because they look too hard at me. You know what I'm saying? Like just because of a past experience and stuff like that, and we're just connecting a whole bunch of BS. And now we're in a, we're in a loop. Like you said, we're, we're back in this loop, 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 loop of the same BS because we don't know how to we don't know how to break through. And like you said, we do that critical thinking and we just take two of those critical things and we just break through. We'll just stop that circle from keep going and eventually it'll break. And then you'll have to, you have to use your own mind, your own thing. But that's that subconscious mind stuff. So for us to actually break through that, we have to bring our thoughts from our back of our head to the front of our head and actually process everything that's going on to day to day and question everything 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 is not what you think it is we have to actually question this is this exactly is this what i'm feeling or is this what somebody else told me to feel is this actually what's going on or i'm assuming it was going on do i i make an assumption or can i just ask this person exactly how they're feeling about me we're assuming that this person is feeling this way instead of just asking in our mind we're assuming that they hate us and stuff like that and i was like what 
I love you. I'm just a, a blunt person. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, you know, because I don't, it, because it doesn't look the way that it looked in your head doesn't mm-hmm. make it not a real thing is what mm-hmm. I had to help myself with. It's like people, and then the thing is that people, if a person truly is supposed to be in your life and they love you, they will gladly speak to any insecurity. Mm-hmm. They will gladly speak to any doubt. But if we never open our mouths, then we live, like you said, we live on the loop. Yep, and so communication is a really big piece of my platform. Like when people call me to do calls with me, more than likely we spend time at first. Our first few calls are always about other people. And every time they ask me questions, it's always trying to break down the other person's thought. Well, mm-hmm. Harley, why do you think they would have done this? I have no idea. Mm-hmm. But I do know this is how this applies directly to you. And by the third or fourth conversation, people have started to shift their thinking. A lot of us, and the and the way, on the road of being taught to be humble and to be selfless, we have been taught to completely discredit, dis- devalue, and disregard ourselves. Mm-hmm. That's why I will never tell a black girl to be humble, a little black girl to be humble. Mm-hmm. I won't. If we look up the definition of being humble, it's nothing that I want to feel. It's nothing that I want to think of myself. I don't ever want to think low of myself. I would like to be grounded. And I tell people that all the time. Because people always say, well, if you don't want to be humble, what you want to be? Harley, are you arrogant? First of all, <laughs> I might be. And I'm going to tell you why I might be. I wake up every day at 430 in the morning. When I, by the time I go to bed, most of the work that I get done within the time that I go, that I wake up the same time that I go to bed can be considered to be about a week's worth of work for some people. So in all, honestly, some days I do show up arrogant and I am proud of my arrogance. My arrogance is a, is a direct result of my work ethic. Yeah. But, but on those days where people are asking me, do you identify with being arrogant? No, but if I'm going to be anything, I'm going to be grounded before I am humble. I am not humble. I don't have a reason to be humble. Yeah. I don't have a reason to look at myself in a low standpoint because even on my days when I'm resting, I am still eating off the fruits of days where I was working hard and giving myself every reason to be arrogant. I walk in my arrogance because I am I am a hard worker. I bust my ass on a day-to-day basis. And a lot of people that I know bust their asses on a day-to-day basis. And the reason why they're not able to get to the next step in their life is because something in their head and somebody once taught them that you're not supposed to clap for yourself. If you climb this much of the mountain, you got to be like, okay, but I still got this much further to go. Great. But if this is where I'm at today, at the end of the day, I'm going to have a party right here. Yeah. And tomorrow when I get right here, I'm going to have a party right here. Exactly, exactly. Every time I plant a flag, I got to have a party. I think people get, they have the problem with arrogant is when a lot of people like take their arrogant, like they take their accomplishment and push it in other people's face. Like, and what I don't, which I feel like you're just saying, I'm proud of who I am. And I'm just expressing that. And I'm just talking about it. A lot of people like, no. I am like a lot of people don't know how to use it in a positive way. And I think that's what people like, oh, you're arrogant. Like, no, you just haven't seen somebody express it in a positive way. Every experience you have with somebody being arrogant been negative. And a lot of ignorant people, like you think you see that word as a negative aspect because the way people use it. And I I think that's why the people have that problem. Like, are you arrogant? Like, I supposed to be, don't, don't we supposed to be? Like you're using the word in the pop in a negative way. So people people just don't know how to separate the two or see seeing it in a positive light because they're like you said, perspective. They only have one perspective of this word. When we said two truths exist at the same time. I love it. One of the, the social cognitive books that I read talks about living life above versus below the line, right? Mm-hmm. And and we talk about things where I can do the same thing. And if I am, my perspective, if, if I'm above the line, it means one thing versus if I'm below the line, it means another thing. For instance, I can go out and dance all night until the sun comes up. If I'm doing it from above the line, I'm probably smiling. I'm having great experiences. I'm meeting the best people in the world. We're having a great time. But if I'm doing it from below the line, I'm probably out. Like there's a Rod Wave song where he says he's standing in the middle of the club trying not to cry off a love song. There are people who go out just to silence the, the negative the negative sounds. So they're in the bar 
and you can watch. I've I've sat in a bar before and watched people sitting at the bar and they look like they crumble into pieces. Mm -hmm. But the only thing that's keeping them alive is this bass to this music. So they sitting at the bar just like that. I feel is like the partying below the line, above above opposed to kind of that partying above the mm -hmm. line where we have that arrogance from below above and below. Because mm -hmm. I do, I have, for instance, the young the young man who just won the Olympics recently. You are a gold medal Olymp uh, uh, Olympian. Why are you doing an interview talking crazy about the NBA? Yeah. Trying to trying to trying to talk about these men and saying uh, the, the NBA is the world champion of what? First of all, I mean, don't get me wrong. The argument, I understand where the argument came from. But young man, you just won gold at the Olympics. You are a world. You are so we are so mentally skewed that you could have we would have rather you spent 20 minutes talking about yeah i'm that my effort yeah. I'm, I'm fucking up the game look at me i'm i'm the fastest mf in this world but you use your 15 20 minutes of fame to shit on mm -hmm. a whole group of a, people and so i would consider that like you just said arrogance below the line yeah because you are in a position you got a platform you got all these cameras in front of your face you could say any positive thing about yourself and you chose to take a negative dig at someone else. That's true. That's true. Like, I kind of, like, with, with that line, I just noticed, like, I probably, I do that with my trauma. Like, well, I've been through a lot of domestic violence. Instead of me talking bad about my abuser, I come on above the line where I empathize with them. And I sit in the place where I try to understand where they was going through their mindset and how they experienced like what caused them to be in the position to do what they did to me. So if people are like, well, I never hear you talk bad about the people. Why would I, you know what I'm saying? Like that serves no benefit to me. My goal is to make myself better to heal and, and making that person look bad is not going to do anything for me. You know what I'm saying? So I kind of do that. And I kind of teach people to do that. Like, no, use a place, sit in a place of empathy with the people that hurt you. You know what I'm saying? And it, it will make you feel a lot better in the situation instead of sitting in a place of victim. Yes. I love that. And I, I was just saying earlier to a happy mm -hmm. talker, there are no bad people in my beautiful, humble mm -hmm. opinion in this world. There are just people yeah. who have been so severely hurt that now they feel the necessity to show up as negative. So mm -hmm. if I meet a person and they can't find anything positive to say about life, I immediately love on them extra hard because how sad has your life been mm -hmm. that you immediately think that I'm going to hurt you, that yep. you immediately think that I'm going to disrespect you, that you immediately think that I'm going to disregard you to the point that you are going out of your way to get ahead of the hurt that you're going to come, come and show up as abuser to me. So I love how beautiful your perspective is. I love that there are more people in this world that are doing that because that, that's a really big piece of my platform. It's like showing unconditional positive regard to all people because every person in this life has gone through something where you guys can be looking eye to eye. Mm -hmm. People say that they would be looking like, you're crazy. I was, on a, I was on a podcast the other day and the lady was like, I don't know if I can forgive them. I don't, how, how can you forgive I'm like, why wouldn't you like it's just it's just not that it, it seemed harder than what it is you're it's so hard because you're resisting you're resisting it you're resisting because you don't want to heal you don't want to let go of the hill you don't want to elevate so that's why it's hard when you want to be something more than what you are it's not that hard it's not and, that hard and it's hard because we refuse we it, it's again back to that arrogance we refuse mm -hmm. to believe that anything else is better than what we have in our mind. Mm -hmm. And we refuse and we believe truly that we can still be the strong, a beautiful, intuitive person that we are today without the hurt that those people have caused us. Mm -hmm. And that's why mm -hmm. I tell people all the time the reason that I love all of the people that have because ever me in my life is because I sit before you guys. I sit on this camera today. I, I open my phone every day and I give motivation from a place. Okay. of understanding mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that understanding does not exist this wisdom does not exist without mm -hmm. the abuse mm -hmm. without, the pain, without the disregarding without the isolation if i was never hurt in that way then this conversation never happens and because i never want to live a life where i don't experience this i have to give gratitude to the people that have hurt me i shook the hand of the man that shot my father in the face and i saw him do it that hurt me probably more than anything I've 
ever done in my life. I think after losing my sister, I shook the hand of the man who shot my father in the head and I watched him do it. I was 14 years old. He didn't know that I was in my father's house. They had whatever beef they had. They ended up having the situation happen. My father, my father was shot. I saw the situation happen. We fast forward. I'm in the hospital the day they pulled the plug. My dad's gone. A couple years later, we find out who did it. This man goes to jail. Nobody else in my family wants to kind of go, whatever. I go meet the man. I shake his hand. I shake his hand because, first of all, I can't bring my dad back. Hating yeah. you for the eternity can't bring my dad back. My dad and I didn't have the most amazing relationship before he died. So I still have to deal with all of that mess and all of that. But I shake your hand because you are a person. And regardless of whatever the suffering that my dad had to incur and deal with, his suffering is over with. He is no longer in this physical realm, but you are. And whatever time that you're about to spend in prison is not going to rehabilitate you based on what I know about the American prison system and is not going to elevate you and your family in any way. So I want to shake your hand because I hope that at least with everything else that you're going to have on your mind and your heart, you don't allow yourself to continuously be weighed down by the thought that I don't forgive you. Yeah. Give you. Because if I have to forgive my father for the, the things that he's done and pretend and, and understand, because it's so funny because when people die, we forget that we had issues with them in life, right? Yeah. People, people, people will pretend like you never had any issues with people in life once they die. Once they die, that's your favorite cousin. Yeah. That's your cousin, that's your love. That's but I have to be real. And I, I even said that when I stood up to talk at my father's funeral in tender age of 14. I said, I can't say much about this man. But I'm sad. Because I feel like I'm supposed to be. But I don't know him. Mm -hmm. So another reason that I shook this man's hand is because I cannot hate you for the rest of my life for killing a man that I didn't know. Yeah. The reason that I ended up in that in that apartment that day with my father, the day that he even got shot, was the fact that my father was trying to make up for the fact that he was a lack thereof. I probably wasn't even supposed to be there that day. So the reality of the situation is, is when, like you said, when we start getting really honest about what life is, we start getting more comfortable with pivoting without having to let our emotions get the best of us. Yeah, that is so true. But um, we're going to like wrap this up because um, it's getting long, but uh, yes, yes. It might be an hour. Hour. look at us. No, yeah. go ahead. Yes. Yes. I got another call coming. Um. Uh, can you please do you have any advice for the listeners before we end this and um after you give your advice can you just plug your information and where that they can schedule a call and all your social media social media and stuff and everything absolutely um forgive forgive as much as possible forgive freely it will not kill you you can find me on all social media platforms at Harley Hendricks six. I'm on everywhere at that exact same name. And then the way you book a call, um, there are instructions right on my social media, but the way you would book a call is stand.store slash Harley Hendricks six. And I'll make sure that I share all of that to you. Um, just at, when we get off of here via email, so you can put that in the videos, but I am Harley Hendricks six on everything. And you can book a call at state at my stand store. If you are out there and you're listening, but you want to be anonymous, like you know that I'm on happy but you want to be anonymous then you can find the happy app which is h-a-p-i and when you go to the app you'll be able to log in become a talker and you'll be able to see me I'm live all day so I'm one of the people one of the first people you see when you get on the app I even signed on to the app from a different device that wasn't mine and I realized that I pop up very fast, very soon. So if you are out here and you want to book a call with me, but you don't want to be seen, because my platform is not anonymous. Happy is anonymous. So if you want to be anonymous, you can go ahead and follow me on Happy. But if you don't want to be anonymous, you can follow me on any social media platform. I answer all my, my platform emails and stuff like that because I'm not nobody's celebrity. Yeah. So if you want to talk directly to me, you're going to talk directly to me, not to my team. Um, but I love you guys so much. And I appreciate you again, beautiful, for having me. You're welcome. And well, that's it for today's episode, guys. Um, We'll be back next week with another episode and have a blessed day. Well, that's it for today's episode of the Sisters Love Podcast. But before we end, I would love to invite you to our exclusive support group. Um, 
All you have to do is subscribe to our mailing list. And once you subscribe, you'll get access to our, our support group for this podcast. And inside that group, you'll get to meet some of the guests that's on the podcast. You'll get resources and you'll get support and you'll have a safe haven. So if you're interested in becoming part of the group, all you have to do is click the link below this uh, episode and sign up to the mailing list and you'll get instant access. Well, that's it for today's episode. I love you. Mm-hmm. Mommy. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I'll see you next week.